Up next on today's Wild West, a Montana dude ranch that could change your life. And every bit of this we cut by hand. A life-changing encounter with Montana sweetgrass. The art of the custom cowboy hat. Plus a visit with a true woman of the West, Montana horse trainer, boot maker, and artist, Tammy Pate. I was on a horse when I was a week old <laughs> with my dad. <laughs> cowboy music in Monterey. She belongs to the land. It's all next on today's Wild West. The Wild West, it's still out there. And we'll show you how to find it. This is today's Wild West. The Rocky Mountains, God's greatest sculpture. That line from the movie Jeremiah Johnson rings especially true on this summer day in northern Montana. And there's no better way to gaze at the towering peaks and awesome vistas than from the back of a horse. It may look like we're in the middle of the wilderness, but this is actually just a day ride out of Deep Canyon Ranch. On a ride of just a couple of hours, we'll ford a mountain river, ride trails that cut through deep woods, and emerge into a vast mountain meadow with spectacular views. Our leader is Wrangler Dave Hovde, who's been giving tours of what he calls his backyard for more than 35 years. You like to show people your backyard, your house, whatever, something that you've put together. Well, I didn't put this together, but it's a really cool place, and it's my backyard, and I love to show it to people. At lunch, we tie up the horses, take a perch atop a cliff that towers above the nearby ranch headquarters far below. But as magnificent as this country is, it wouldn't be much fun to be out here all by yourself. And while the Rocky Mountain front is a powerful attraction, there's something deeper that draws guests to this ranch and keeps people like Joanne Vincent coming back year after year. Well, the people are very nice. That's one thing. Everybody's so relaxed and so friendly, and everything is so nice, like the scenery, everything. It's uh, just incredible. <laughs> I always want to go back. I feel more home here than my own place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I always cry when I leave, that's for sure. <laughs> Lots of tears are shed at this place that's really more of a refuge for the soul than anything else. We get a lot of guests, I think, that, that come here with a lot going on in their lives. And um, a lot of times it's women, surprisingly enough, uh, that, that come here because they're, they're going through something they find that they're needing to sort through. A trip to Deep Canyon is more than just a vacation, as important as that is. Time spent here gives people a chance to get out from under the pressures of day-to-day -day life and perhaps reflect on where their lives are going. And the wonderful family that owns this ranch believes it's their mission to help people do just that. They come and within the first day, they're, they're just laying it all out there and they, they find an environment that they can trust. And we really feel like it, it is a ministry of sorts because we, we just treat them like, like they're a friend and we do genuinely care for what they're going through. Deborah Renteria runs the ranch with her parents Chuck and Sharon Blixrud, who've been welcoming guests to this part of the West for more than 56 years. Our mission is to help people reset their clocks. Sometimes where, you, where you're working, you can't see a solution and then you get away from it for a little while and, and so all of a sudden the answers will come. That's a lot of what I think we're here for. Now don't get me wrong, Deep Canyon is a western ranch. It's great to be up in the morning and watch the sun light up the surrounding granite. A cool old buffalo skull hangs from the ranch gate. Dave is up early to saddle up the wrangle horse who's been kept in overnight in the corral to ride out and gather the guest horses from their pasture. We'll see you in a little while. All right. There's no cows here on the ranch. Instead, this mountain country is home to elk, deer, and bear. Dave's more of a packer than a cowboy, a horseman who leads wilderness pack trips into the back country as opposed to cattle drives, but it's still plenty Western. There is a certain mystique about the West and cowboys, and we're part of that, you know, just with our horses and mules and what we do. People come here to experience the West. However, without people, the West can be nothing more than real estate. But this magnificent country, the horses, the rustic lodge, and all the rest, provides the perfect setting for people to connect. You know, 
such a cool place to be. But once they come here, what you end up doing is building a relationship with them. So they end up going home as friends. They come as guests, go home as friends. And that's the big thing, you know. That's what causes them to come back again. You might just come back for the good food too, like thick slices of ham and Dutch baby pancakes for breakfast. That's all a part of the experience too, is eating well. We have a long history of good cooks in our family, and so we, um, that's important to us, the standard of what comes out of the kitchen. This is a riding ranch, but the streams the horses cross are also excellent for fishing. You can hike, watch birds, explore the wildflowers, or just chill. We've got one guy from New York that comes for three weeks to every spring. He brings several bottles of scotch and several cigars, and he never leaves the grounds on foot by any means. He drives to town every day and gets the newspaper and comes back, and he just sits. He stays in the trap line where he can see Ear Mountain, and he's happy. He feels like he comes home. That's, he feels like he's coming home for three weeks. But Deep Canyon also has a history of drawing those who need more than that like the newly widowed 28-year-old who wound up sharing her tearful story with Deborah. The day she was checking out, she said, I, I don't want to leave. And she says, I don't suppose you have something for me to do. Long story short, I got to thinking, because we ended up shorthanded. We knew we were going to be shorthanded come the 1st of August. And I, I called her and I said, hey, what do you think? And she said, I would love to. She just felt that this was a really good place to work through her sadness and her grief. She felt safe and loved and cared for, and so she'll be back. That's actually, I think, what this place does. Deborah says many people take a vacation that doesn't provide any real relief. Not the case here. As grand as a mountain ride can be, it's really just a gateway to a place of restoration and even healing. The feeling of contentment and peace and relaxation, I think, does something uh, to your soul. When people leave and you see a tear in their eye, or you get a good firm handshake when they leave, or that's, uh, that's what's rewarding. People come and they just, they just fall into an easy pace here that, that I, I think when they leave, they, they just feel like they've really had a vacation. Up next, making candles, soaps, and dreams come true with Montana Sweetgrass. On a quiet country road outside Great Falls, Montana, you'll find a small field of tenderly cultivated grass. It may not look like much, but this fragrant plant is known as sweetgrass. <laughs> Braided bundles of the grass have been burned as a kind of incense for countless generations in sacred Native American ceremonies. Today, the precious harvest from this tiny plot of ground and the candles, soaps, and other products made from it are making the dreams of Native American Tony McClue finally come true. My daughter-in-law flew up from California and said, you're, you're going to do this. I even get choked up. <laughs> Anyways, give me a minute. Fifteen years earlier, the single mom spotted an intriguing basket of sweet grass displayed at a gift store. And I thought, hmm, that's very interesting. You know, I think that would be interesting. Let's go this way. An idea began to grow, one that never let her go. And I had this business in my head for a long time. I had not, I, I knew what my labels were going to look like. I knew what the bottling was going to look like and everything, but it's all in my head. But at times, working several jobs just to survive, an idea is all that remained. Then six years before our interview, Tony's hours were cut back to part time, and she finally quit, took the plunge, launched her business, and never looked back. One day I walked out there and I go, just do it, you know. A one-time art instructor, Tony put her creativity to work, cultivating her grass and marketing it in bunches, braids, soaps, body mist, bath salts, candles, and other products. Candles made of sweet grass. Well, it has the sweet grass scent to it. The great appeal of sweet grass is its sweet scent, which comes from the Coumadin the plant contains, a chemical used to make blood thinner. Tony grows all of her own grass and gets two harvests a year out of this plot. But it's a lot of work. We actually sit down in, in the grass, yeah. and every bit of this we cut by hand with scissors. We'll grab a handful and cut, 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 and we've done this whole, whole field. Once it's harvested and cu cut, and it's laying in a swath out in the field, then we'll bring it in, and 
will clean it. It takes up to three cleanings to get the grass prepared to market in bunches or braids. And we do thousands of these at a time. And nothing is wasted. Any excess clippings are used to create Tony's handmade candles and other scented products. And the learning never ends. This sweet grass has taught me every year it teaches me something new, doesn't it? Every year. I'm always, I've told Jill, I said I learn something every year on how to raise sweet grass or how to tie or do, you know. Native Americans still burn sweet grass braids as a smudging incense. Sunlight can fade the color, but the bunches and braids can last for years. And that's the question that's always asked. So I found some grass that was five years old and I hydrated it and braided it and it smelled like I picked it yesterday and it looked like I picked it yesterday. Tony's Sweetgrass products have three endorsements from the state of Montana. Montana grown, Montana made, and since she's Chippewa Cree, Native American made as well. The only challenge is making enough. Well, it was such a big hit. I can't grow enough grass now. And my crop is probably four times bigger than when I first started, and that still isn't enough. Tony's Montana Sweetgrass business has blossomed through nothing more than word of mouth, without even a website. Carried by stores all over Montana and shipped all over the country and around the world. I just didn't realize what demand there was for it or how many people even really knew about it. You know, it was something I thought that only maybe the natives knew about at that time. But as I've been selling, I'm finding out there's, there's a lot of interest in it. Step through the swinging doors of the Law Dog Hat Company, and you've actually entered an artist's studio. It's a wearable piece of art. It's, no, it is a piece of art. It becomes part of that person. The son of Montana artist Bill Raines, known for his life-size sculptures, Randy Raines has been using his own creative talent to design and build custom cowboy hats for the past 35 years. Just being artistic, it's in the blood, and when you take that piece of felt and turn it into something, it's, it's just a wonderful feeling to me. I just love it. The dozens of handcrafted hats displayed in his building shop are an amazing variety of shapes, sizes, styles, and colors. Who would imagine there are so many variations on a cowboy hat? People sometimes think, oh, gee, there's black and brown and, and silver belly, and that's all my choices are. And there's more than that. Same with the brim. But some people like a big brim, and they can't find anywhere. We'll do all that. I mean, whatever you want to do, I'm your guy. Some derby hats are in the mix as well. And the one that grabs everyone's attention is the purple top hat, ordered by a musician who never picked it up. Yeah, that one uh, is one of the most tried on hats in the shop. Randy was just 19 when he was first hired to clean and repair hats at a custom hat shop and within months was promoted to making hats himself. Something coming from me, it's got to look really good. So I took that as my own product, if you will. They're called hat bodies or hat blanks. Like a painter's blank canvas, Randy starts with a raw felt hat body. When it's finished and done into a customer's hat, we'll be finished like that. So we'll take the raw blank, put it over the steamer. It usually takes a good half day to craft a custom hat. Now we pull that over the block. But on this Saturday, Randy gives us a quick time demonstration. The rope here ensures that the size isn't going to stretch out on them. Blocking the hat is step one. It's going to be a seven and eight. For sizing. A six inch crown, which is open from this point to that point, and a four inch brim is the most common size. The steam iron flattens out the brim which is then trimmed. And that trims it off there. Then comes the sandpaper. As long as you know what you're doing, you're not gonna hurt it. You're actually gonna make this felt smooth because it's got a rough feel to it right now. After another dose of steam and a spray or two of stiffener, shaping begins with the crease of the crown. But you wanna make sure it's exactly in the middle. The fit of the hat depends on the shape of a customer's head, which come in a wide variety. Round, crooked, They've had a hat that sat on them for years. It's always set off to the left or always set off to the right. I've never had one fit. I think we talked about it with you. Right. I'm one of those who's always had a tough time getting a cowboy hat to fit right until I came to see Randy. They always thought the hat was messed up. Well, as it being that person's head might be crooked. Uh, they might be too round. All that I can fix. And that's what people like is it's for years I dealt with this and I didn't know it was me. But when they leave here and they're thrilled because the hat sits straight on them, that's that's a great feeling also. So this has all been what I call the fun part. Some hat makers use a machine to measure a customer's head size and shape, but all Randy needs is a cloth tape measure. As looking at their head, I can always tell if it's round or crooked, long oval, round oval. It's part of being in business for so many years. I can't help but look at a person's head, their hat, 
I see movies, I'm looking at hats. And he can make any custom hat you want, including duplicating one from your favorite Western movie. And most of the time, I'll have the movie, and I can just fast forward, pause it on just a perfect shot of that hat, and make it just like it. A Western film is always playing on the big screen TV in Randy's shop, which is decorated with his collection of vintage Western movie posters. I love old Western movie posters. Uh, this particular print I found. Randy makes the rustic wood frames himself, along with much of the furniture in his shop, most of which is for sale. Woodworking, another passion of this talented man. I had ideas of furniture I wanted for my shop, and you couldn't just find what I'm looking for anywhere. So I thought, you know, I've been woodworking for years, so I'm just going to make my own stuff. <sighs> That's beautiful. Thank you. It is a very cool shop. I'll be working on a hat, or I might see a movie or something and go, I like that hat, but it could be, this could be done or this could be done. I'll go, you know, I need to make one like that. Many of Randy's customers never actually set foot in Billings, ordering over the phone or online instead. But however it's done, the goal is always the same. Whatever makes them happy, that's what I do. California bust, yeah, that's a story of the wagon train rolling, no. Story of the wagon train rolling, yeah, story of the wagon train rolling. Welcome to the Monterey Cowboy Poetry and Music Festival. There's not a whole lot of people that really paint the way he painted. I'm so excited about that. A three day gathering of Western art, artisans, cowboy poets, and singer songwriters. She belongs to the land. All in celebration of the Western lifestyle. Everything about it. I like being on my horses. You know, I like uh, roping, doctoring cattle. It's just great to show our history and you know, getting together with other ranch families. We came for the Sons of the San Joaquin. The cowboy music you hear at this festival is not the country music you hear on the radio. Instead, it's stories of the cowboy life of the rural West, often told by performers who've lived it. I tell him the cowboy's a verb, not a noun. It's what you do more than a name. Like poet and storyteller Waddy Mitchell, who spent decades as a working Nevada cowboy. I spent 26 years as a buckaroo, and now I talk about it. Well, it's more of a lifestyle than it is a business, you know. It's, uh, we, we just love the music and the poetry and all that kind of thing, keeping the Western lifestyle alive, you know. And Last night I had a cowboy's dream. The beloved Don Edwards is one of the best known performers in cowboy music, which has been around as long as cowboys. Actually, cowboy music is, uh, is it was a branch of folk music. Everybody knew old cowboy songs, you know. The old Chisholm Trail and Whoopi Tayo and all those old cowboy songs that they sang. This is a song that I wrote after some conversations with my son on satellite phone a few weeks before he came back from Afghanistan. But the tunes aren't just about loping along and singing a song. After all, life in the West, with its harsh weather, hard work, and long days horseback, is no easy thing. And performers aren't shy about writing about those realities and other issues as well. That transport chopper's leaving now to take us to the plane. Me and my boys are good as gone. So Lord, heal our nation. Oh Lord, heal our land. But while the topics can sometimes get serious, it's not that easy trying to make a goal that in this day and age is an accordion playing yodeling cowboy. <laughs> There's no one quite like Sourdough Slim to lighten the mood. In fact, I hate to bring it up, but this accordion has been into the pawnbroker so many times, he can play the thing better than I can. Cowboy music comes in many forms. Oh, oh, oh. Kitty Moffat's serenade to a girl's best friend, her pistol. This radiating heat from her custom holster. And the western swing and jazz flavored music of cow bop. There's other talent on display at the festival as well. 
One of the cool things about the Monterey Festival is the gear show. Here you can find all kinds of cool cowboy stuff, art to hang on your wall, jewelry to hang around your neck, and bridles, bits, and spurs for your horse. And this is our line of what we call horseshoe brand hardware that you would use on the Western gear. Colleen Watt is manning the booth for husband Jeremiah, a well-known custom saddle maker and silversmith. He does it all hand engraved. Here's a piece of his, this is a bracelet that he made many years ago. And it's filigree, which he cuts all that out of the silver after he engraves it. That was Carmel Beach. Nearby is the Western art of the late Jack Swanson. He was very much into the California history, like the bandits of the of California, like Joaquin Murrieta. You'll see grizzly bears being roped on Carmel Beach. Celebrating that history and heritage and its timeless values are what this festival and others like it across the country are all about. She belongs to Few people would associate Monterey, California with cowboys, but this is where the Spanish introduced the cattle ranching lifestyle that gave birth to the vaquero traditions that eventually developed into what we now know as the American cowboy. The Spanish people brought the cattle here and the Spanish people brought the horses here. So kind of got to say that there'd be no cowboys without the Spanish culture. And we honor that here in old Monterey and California is a great uh, example historically, of the true roots of uh, our calling. California was one of the largest cattle producing states in the nation for many, many years. And it's still a very huge competitor in the, uh, in the cattle industry. It's gotta come from the heart. It ain't something that comes from the mind. As long as there are cowboys and cowgirls, horses and cattle. Here we go now. Home, home on the rain. People will gather to celebrate the life in the West so many of us love. I was on a horse when I was a week old with my dad. And every out every day since. <laughs> There's lots to love about the American West, but the best part of it all are Westerners. My dad was a rodeo steer wrestler. And there may be no better example of that than Tammy Pate. All of my summers, any time that I could get away from my parents, I was with my grandma Betty riding. The horse trainer, cover girl, cow girl, mother, and wife of acclaimed horse and livestock trainer Kurt Pate is also an artist a bootmaker and instructor of a unique program that combines yoga and horsemanship. When we're riding, what are we trying to do? Yoke or unite with another, another living being. We met Tammy at her family's ranch in tiny Rygate, Montana. My grandma raised four boys in it and it's about a thousand square feet. <laughs> this home's been in Tammy's family for four generations. This was a railroad building that was moved here. Driving by what might appear to be a rather modest looking ranch property, you'd never guess at the hard work, entrepreneurial spirit, and can-do attitude that goes on here. This was an old ice house years ago, and uh, we have remodeled it into my boot shop. I love butterflies. Butterflies are very traditional in boots. Tammy was a newlywed living in Helena, working as a tailor and repairing some Western furniture when she asked to use the sewing machine of local bootmaker Mike Ryan. He said, I'm a five years behind in my bootmaking orders. He said, do you want to learn to build boots? <laughs> and I did. These are a couple of pairs that I built. Tammy built dozens of pairs of boots for Mike and now has all the tools and machines to make her own. They're ancient. The sole stitcher shaped the heels with. So the only nails in this boot are the nails holding on the rubber heel cap. Everything else is wood pegged and hand sewn together. Boot making was really just another expression of her artistic talent. I love to do inlays. That's my, my thing. That seed was planted by her beloved grandmother. I think she was 89 here. She was your mentor? Yes, taught me everything. To cook, sew, ride. Tammy spent many a day riding with her grandmother while growing up in this country where she also learned to rodeo. 
My dad was a bulldogger. He was our coach. I have two younger sisters and we practiced every single night. She went on to become Miss Rodeo Montana. And we had a fundraiser and I drew that picture. And my grandpa, who owned this place, Grandpa Jean Clark, bought that. And so my grandma left it in the house and I got it. <laughs> I love uh, art, yeah. I want to be an artist when I grow up. <laughs> also, is uh, horse training just a sideline? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Actually, they're all sidelines. <laughs> Her husband, Kurt, is a favorite subject. I love painting our life. Kurt was on the road teaching a clinic when we stopped by. Her bronc riding some miles was down the trail somewhere, too. This is Mesa. Hi, Mesa. <laughs> but daughter Mesa was home from Oklahoma, where she's enjoying growing success raising buck and bulls for the rodeo business. I had a bull called Highway 12, and he was in the running for Buck and Bull of the Year. So now it's a family operation raising the Buck and Bulls, huh? Yes, yep, takes, takes a village. <laughs> That's a whole nother story, but training and handling cows is very similar to dealing with horses. The same principles apply uh, working cattle or working a colt in a round pin. Balance point, pressure, flight zone. Tammy also uses those principles in her yoga and horsemanship seminars teaching fundamentals that can be applied anywhere. The main thing that I try to get through to people is confidence. Because when we're confident, we can have fun, we can aspire to our dreams, and confidence is the hardest thing to teach, really. There's no confidence builder quite like becoming confident horseback, which can lead you to try other things. Have goals that are realis realistic, to achieve and then when we achieve these goals, I think that's how we build confidence. It was found on this place. Perhaps that's what the spirit of the West is really all about. And why as long as there are people like Tammy Pate and her family, the American West will have a great future. That's it for now. We're back next time with more cool stuff from today's Wild West. I'm Mark Bedore. We'll see you down the trail. For more information on the people and places featured in Today's Wild West, or to order show DVDs and books, visit todayswildwest.com.